by 2043, the population begin to decrease. The question is, why do you need to build a capacity of 9 million, and therefore, a requirement for 4,800 hectare land? They cannot explain it. Okay, what I intend to do is not in the detail how much land, where are they, all of that. I know most people are really not familiar with the subject. They hear all this uh, sound bite about what's going on now. Uh, the government trying to find more land and there's a consultation, right? So my objective is to share with you what's going on in Hong Kong. How do they address a problem from different points of view? In a lot of ways, of course, I introduced uh, what the uh, land shortage, if, if any, and how the government and other people try to solve it, and our points of view. Okay? Uh, I say smoke and mirror. The reason is a lot of uh, information, a lot of uh, government message, and other parties are really, really smoke and mirror. And I would like to take the opportunity, as I call it, subject, to sort of deconstruct those uh, uh, smoke and mirror. Okay, I guess you all know what smoke and mirror, right? Okay, all right. The general problem of planning for a city in its simplest term, okay, talk about people, what's the population, what's the housing need, and what's the economy you need for supporting the community. And from there, you sort of figure out how much land you need. Okay, that's the typical the dynamic, the triad of urban planning. Now, of course, in reality, it's much more complicated than other concern. Uh, conservation, I'm sure see what about country park, uh, about where the land are, where you build, so all the complexity. But at the end of the day, we are looking at three main drivers that drive land. Now, that's a simple model. But different people look at it from different angles. Like, what do, I, what do I emphasize? Do I emphasize economy? Uh, do I emphasize people and house? And there is an issue and a spoken mirror that we're seeing in Hong Kong now. So let's take a look at how different people look at the problem. Now, clearly, uh, you cannot see the little symbol here called pain and suffering. Little box about people and housing. Pain and suffering mean pain. Living conditions bad, housing expensive, artificial housing. So it's, it's a people living livelihood condition. That's one thing to drive the process. Okay, it's kind of bottom, bottom up. You count the people, you count the living space, you count the to grow, and you figure out how much money you need. That's one approach. Another way is, is the economy. We need to build a city that can live for the future. So planning using economic is a driving point. Okay, give me a good, good example. Uh, everyone been to Pudong in Shanghai, Pudong. They transformed that Pudong place from basically a village into the Wall Street uh, of Shanghai. I worked in Pudong in the 90s. I witnessed firsthand my office between the people, People's Bank of China and the Shanghai Stock Exchange. In the case of Pudong, they don't talk about how many people live there. They don't ask about how many, how many houses. They talk about how to transform Pudong uh, to be the premium commercial financial center of China and use that as a basis uh, to, uh, to create, to, to create, to see how the land is being used. So that's two dynamic ways of finding land, the rationale of finding land. Guess what, guess what Hong Kong rationale, <coughs> at least from the government point of view, take a guess, which point of view Hong Kong government will take. Pain and suffering or game changer from a government point of view? Take a guess. Okay, I think it's an easy one, it's an easy one. We heard all about uh, the partition house problem. Okay. 93,000 family living, uh, with 210,000 public living in four or five people per like 100 square foot. We heard about long waiting time to get the public housing, four or five seven years to get the housing. Okay? And for the government, that's a pressure. They need to provide housing for these pain people are of pain, of pain and suffering. And that's a driving point, a driving force. 
the uh, the get government attention, all right? And in the current uh, land supply consultation, they pick three words. The issue: uh, tiny pricing and craft. So they summarize the issue of land supply into expensive, small, and tight space. And people are waiting, so they're going to fix the problem. So how do they do it? What's the planning process? Anyone heard about it 20, 30 plus? The Hong Kong long term plan, have you heard of, does it ring a bell? 20, 30 plus? Not too many, huh? Yeah, Basically, uh, it's a government. They, they do it every six, seven years. Uh, so this last go around, they project Hong Kong is a new need between now and 2046. Okay, so that's called 2030 plus. And that's the basis of government projecting land housing requirement. Now, there are like six or eight different brochure, color brochure. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it boils down to this, the whole study, the whole study, you don't have to read it, this is it, this is it. They concluded they need to build a million flat in the next 30 years, okay, to satisfy the economic and housing need of Hong Kong. And these, a million unit plus land for commercial use, will pick up require 4,800 hectares of land. So the demand the government project is that we need 4,800 hectares of land in the next 12 years. And since they say we only have 3,600, therefore, there's a shortfall of 1,200 hectares that need to be somewhere defined. So this 1,200 hectares become the holy grail of where are they? Where do you find the 200 hectares? That's the essence of the current land supply consultation, okay? But there's a problem. There's a problem. Once they've done this uh, calculation, uh, they, been, they, they rationalize how, how, uh, how these American flag composed of, okay, you want to And they figure out, wow, if they do this, the capacity to handle 9 million people, 9 million, okay? Uh, now, do we have 9 million people? Not really. The uh, official forecast from the statistics department, because of all kinds of reasons, the uh, aging population, late marriage, small family, more people uh, passing away. So actually, by 2043, the population begin to decrease. We are 7.4 million now. By 2043, the peak is 8.2 million. In fact, it will start dropping to 7.8 around 2064. So the question is, why do you need to build a capacity of 9 million and therefore a requirement for 4,800 hectares of land? They cannot explain it. Uh, they say, well, maybe uh, that's a baseline forecast, but we think that the high forecast, we will need to reach 9 million people. Oh really, the question is, what condition you can have 9 million population? And let's take a look. Again, that's the statistics department forecast. The condition, the condition, the four conditions that Hong Kong will repeat population of 9 million. One, make more babies. If Hong Kong men and women work harder, more frequently, and have 10% more birth rate, that's one condition. And no one, stay healthy, die later. Okay, then you, another condition. Let me ask you, what policy do you have to make people make more babies? What policy you can let people die? Hong Kong already have the longest uh, longevity in the world, and you want to extend it by 10%? Give me a break. Another condition. Do you realize there are more people leaving Hong Kong now than coming in? Not counting the one-way permit from Mina. Okay, there are more people actually leaving Hong Kong than coming in. Another condition uh, to reach Nam is that 
Every year, there's 2,000 more people coming in now. The last condition, the daily quota for one-way toilet had to meet the quota 150. Actually, uh, it doesn't reach the quota now. Around 110, 120. In fact, the forecast is between uh, 110. So these conditions, under normal circumstances, without specific policy stimulation, just ain't gonna happen. All right. So basically, the uh, one spoken mirror is that the government is over planning the capacity. Right on the back, when you plan on population 9 million versus reality 800, you are inflating the demand. Well, that's one spoken mirror. Uh, okay, so now, you can say, well, I'm going to ask your opinion. I'm going to consult you, uh, they have a task force, and they select about 14 choices. And if you go to the, uh, the, the, the on that, you can fill up the survey form to pick uh, the, the, the land that would meet the 1,200 hectares shortfall requirement. There are four, 14 choices. Now, very interesting, the conversation over the last six months become finding any land to converge in reclamation. So all the, all the noise, the interview, the government, all the talk is reclamation, reclamation, reclamation. And look at the list of options. The biggest area of land uh, is East Land Harbor Province. Anyone heard about what, anyone know what ELM is? Sun Blue, most down, right? Anyway, so it's also by reclamation, a thousand hectares. Uh, the five site, uh, another area, 480, uh, it's also reclamation. So in other words, the government looking at reclamation and this big East London metropolis, which I'll explain it more, as the uh, main way to meet this 1,200 hectare shortfall. So if you participate in this survey, you are asked to pick these so that it reached 1,200. But they're very tricky, they're very tricky. You have to choose, in order to meet the 1,200 requirement, you have to pick one of the three, the new territories, land reclamation, and ELM. If you don't, if you do not choose at least one of the three, it won't meet the 1,200. So the government is forcing you to pick one of the three that they want you to pick. So this is a little game, another spoken mirror, okay? Now, let me elaborate on here. It's very important. It is the biggest infrastructure, most complex, most risky infrastructure project in the history of Hong Kong. Briefly, they know, uh, they call it the Central Water Passageway between uh, Kelly Town and Lan Town. They're going to reclaim land in Kan Yi Chow and around here in Belt, connected the wall by tunnels and railway and highway. Uh, it will hold about uh, 100, a thousand hectares of population. It can house 700,000 population with a CBD and hungover and so on. We estimate this will cost around $500 million. Uh, may I remind you, the capacity with this will be $9 million. So we are spending $500 million on something that we do not need. Okay, so it's expensive. And they will see it won't solve the problem near term because it won't be completed until 2040. So it will not solve the pain and suffering of the condition housing or people in long waiting queue. Would not. And think about it. It's in the middle of a sea. Okay? Four kilometers of mainland. We have global warming, we have rising sea level, I'm sure CY will talk about that. Imagine, imagine, have a CBD in the middle of the sea, the number 10 signal, when the sea level is forecast to rise about 1.2 meters in the next 50 years. Who would put a data center in this environment? So geographically, this is untenable. And now let's look here. Now, okay, let me switch gear now. So those are the government point of view, using the people, pain and suffering to drive the land plan process. What about the uh, game changer using economic development? Okay, 
I'll bring up this group called Hong, our Hong Kong Foundation. Why do I do that? You will hear a lot about this group in the next six months because they're advocating the planning of land in Hong Kong to drive the economy, and I'll, I'll explain. Why are they important? We have a meeting in the Green, this is Cabe, Baron. When they have a press conference, they have it yesterday in the Convention Exhibition Center. Who are the company? All major developers? Sinoland, Henderson, New World, Hanlong, Suiyang, Shenhua, Shima, all developers. Big business like Huifeng Group, Nikan Pi, all investment firms, they're all big way. Other than King Albert, you know King Albert, right? Uh, Bernard Chan, or ex, uh, ex council, ex uh, council member, Pansy Ho, Elsie Lam, the ex secretary of uh, justice, Lam Wen Huang, the convener of the executive council, you know Adam Zewin, Victor Fong or Ten Fong Group, Henry Chan of New World. So these are the business establishment. They look at land supply from the economic view, from the point of view, as a game changer. And you hear game changer a lot. Yeah, that's the slogan. That slogan is to use economic development as a game changer. Transform Hong Kong uh, to the next plateau. So you can guess what's the angle. The angle is economic game changer. How do you do that? They claim to do that, this is a one-page summary of the entire argument. You heard of the Belt and Road Initiative, China built to uh, develop the infrastructure in, in the Central Asia all the way to the Middle East. You heard of the Greater Bay Area, right? The nine cities in Guangdong that was the uh, plan in conjunction with Hong Kong and Macau. So they call Great Bay, uh, Greater Bay Area. These Hong Kong Foundation, don't, oh, I should mention, Dong Chi Wah, the chairman, I forgot, I very important people. Dong, Dong Chi Wah, the uh, last chief of uh, chief is a chairman of this group, okay? So, the whole point is that Hong Kong is sitting next to two gold mines, the Belt and, Self, Belt and uh, the Belt Road Initiative and the Great Bay Area. Two go line, and we're connected to them by the Juhai Bridge and High Bridge Train. Unless we develop a platform, a place, an area that we can reach out and train them from the go mine, we get out of the game. So the argument is that we need a lot of land to tap into this go mine. And yesterday, uh, there were a few conventions, only a few press conferences to roll out the plan. What are they advocating? Basically, reclamation, reclamation, more reclamation. In the study, they proposed 4,400 hectares of reclamation all over Hong Kong. All Hong Kong. In addition to what the government plan to do, in addition to the Eastland Town of Troubles. Okay? And now let's look in here. And they just published the report. Remember Game Changer? So they look at their approach, having a gold mine to raise Hong Kong economy by huge reclamation. And in particular, they are going to double the size of East Lanka metropolis. Remember that the one I showed before, only a, a thousand hectare, uh, 700,000 people. They want to reclaim 2,200 hectares. It's like a house 1.1 1. 1 billion, basically double it, almost double it, the size of the government uh, proposed. Okay? Now, again, it wouldn't take much to figure out how much cost, knowing the uh, infrastructure cost of tunnel and railway and roads and reclamation. We estimate it will be about, uh, cost about $700 billion. Okay. And with that, the capacity for population is 9.4 million. Again, where are people coming from? Right? They will argue because of the gold mine, people coming back and forth, uh, therefore 
we will have 9.4 million people. But that's a, that, that's a dream, that's a wish. Unless there is a government articulate a population policy, you look at the statistics department forecast, it not will get 9.4 million. It just won't happen. And then let's look at Europe. What does that mean? The three major infrastructure projects of Hong Kong so far, the, the Johan Bridge, High Speed Train, and so Railway, all together, it's only about 300 billion. So this is the most expensive, most complex, and high risk infrastructure project in Hong Kong history. And maybe you don't really need it. You don't need it because of population concern. And maybe it's not sustainable because of your rapid consideration, rising sea level, and so on. Okay, so that's their point of view. Now, uh, we all know, and many people come and study, people in this <coughs> room, people from the citizen councils, Paul is Paul, Paul still here. Uh, Paul knows this well, so I'm not going to list uh, what other land available. The fact is, if we look hard enough, not even hard enough. We know there are land in situ. For example, <coughs> the government only marked about 450 hectares of land from the private. There are thousands of hectares of land owned by uh, developers doing nothing, and the government is trying to only extract about 450. So there are at least another 550 of land from the private ownership. We heard about a small housing policy for indigenous villagers, 900 hectares. Uh, abandoned farmland, maybe. Uh, you can clarify. Maybe uh, it's not quite, but anyway. The word itself is wrong. Huh? The word itself is abandoned. Okay. It's wrong. It's for housing. You know what I mean? Well, it's, it's not it's abandoned. Huh? It's, uh, I know, yeah. You know. Now, this is according to uh, Professor Mikan and today. So, we can depend on numbers, but they're there. Right? The government temporary, temporary use land, the short term lease land, the elite 200, 200 of those are doing nothing for the. Uh, short-term leasing, another 109 temporary land to nothing. Uh, this uh, very outstanding work done by the uh, Libra, Libra Land Research Group can give you a full analysis of this list of land available. Okay. So they have land in situ, but we don't need to spend 700 billion for the big one, or at least 500 billion for the small one, BLM. Okay, this is a land. How about development option? There are plenty of options, and Paul and I have been uh, working with other parties to identify them. Let me summarize the East Denver metropolis. Certain other people, a thousand uh, hectare of land. That worked out to $700,000 investment for every resident who live in East Denver metropolis. If you do the math for this expanded one on a per person basis, it's also about $700,000. Uh, per person to locate in this uh, extended enhanced East DLM. Whereas in the current new development area, Hong Sui Hill, that's being constructed right now, uh, it can help 200,000 a quarter million people at a cost of 50 billion. That works out to be about 200,000 dollars per person. So that's the big conflict between developing on existing land versus going in the middle of the sea. Even if you want to do use reclamation, and uh, our friend in the Faro plant, urban planning company, they created or they designed this town near Zhong Man O, called Nam Tong New Town, that can house 350,000 people, and by reclaiming 212 hectares of land. We are not opposed to uh, uh, reclamation as a religion. We believe you need to do it as a last resort when nothing else is available, and you should do it. You should do it for a reason, not just creating a land bank. Okay. In that design, uh, it worked out to be about 300,000 per, per resident. So you can see there are land available, they are designed, they are more economical. So what the uh, Hong Kong government uh, using the pain and suffering approach, and the tycoon using the economic approach, I just feel a smoke and mirror. Okay? Now, uh, when you see smoke and mirror, what do you do? You understand? I understand. So I hope, 
I give you some information. So when the next time you see a low smoke at you, what do you do? You bring out your body extinguisher. You put in it, you just pull on smoke. So I hope I shall see in explain you the big picture. And then some some argument you hear over and over again from the government and you'll hear a lot more from the Hong Kong Foundation in the next few months. So thank you very much. <laughs>